uh, thank you for watching. I was going to say joining in. This isn't live. Thank you for watching. Um, this is Spoken Mirrors Episode 2, Far From the Bedding Crowds interview series with writers, luminaries, charlatans, uh, and other, other figures. Um, my name's Ian McCartney, and today I'm joined by Roseanne Watt. Hello. I'm wondering if I'm a charlatan. <laughs> No, you're an exception. You're yeah. It's a special episode, non charlatan episode, non charlatan. Um, yeah. So, um, Roseanne, you are a poet and a musician and a filmmaker. You're all three. Um, and I suppose yeah. I suppose I'd like to start by asking, um, wh what came first in that mix, if any? Oh, oh, definitely writing. Okay. Um, uh huh. I think. Uh, yeah, I remember being a just a, a pretty nerd and writing endless pages and pages of stories and uh, poetry for my teachers to mark poor things <laughs> <laughs> so yeah definitely the writing came first um but then uh I think after that it was definitely music music is the uh is the one thing that I feel is um like almost an innate understanding rather as have something I learned to do. It was something that just kind of chimed immediately. Um, so I feel like, yeah, writing was definitely the thing that came first, but when I started to play music, then it felt more innate. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. And filmmaking was just, uh, that was years, years down the line. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so I suppose, I suppose the thing with music is there's an almost uh, a textural sense of it and, you know, people appreciate it as like this big universal background thing while the others are maybe, I don't know, like it's people in a village of influence kind of, you know, for writers, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's, it's these small connected groups and then it's like a lateral value. But then with music, like everybody listens to it and it's kind of yeah, within yeah. that constant Definitely. stream and sort of universal because of it. Um, I think, yeah, because it's like, like music in many ways is like, obviously I loved music before I knew how to write. Um, I think all children do. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was when I started to like actually understand that I could play it mm. like myself. It wasn't just this like uh, mystical thing <laughs> yeah yeah i was i mean it's, it feels mystical to me because it's like it is something that i understand better than like a lot of like the art stuff that i do i feel like music is something that um like i don't have to think about too much in order to do it um not not do it well but like just do it if you know what i mean yeah no 100 percent. yeah what, what was the first cd you ever bought oh god so um my first cd that i ever had i didn't buy it uh -huh. for myself was um spice by the spice girls powerful the first, powerful the first one i bought myself um was i think it was dookie by green day Okay. Um, uh, yeah. I never had I never had enough money to be buying a lot of CDs. I would tend to like get enough money to go on a, get a bus fare up to Larwick and, and hang out looking at the CDs <laughs> in the record shop rather than buy them. But yeah, no, it was. I think it was Dookie by Green Day. I was a nice. uh, very into uh, Green Day when I was young. <laughs> That's beautiful. And mine was uh, well, the first one that I got that I asked for was called um, Boy Crush. And it was an anthology CD of like all these like early two thousands male pop stars. Because I thought if I got Girl Crush, that'd be too effeminate, Rosanne. <laughs> so I went, at age eight, oh, I, I got see. Boy Crush. <laughs> um, the first uh, one, the first one I ever bought was Two Door Cinema Club, which oh, is that's very cool. That... Well, it's very early twenty tens. Yeah. It was iPhone commercial pop or whatever, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was mine. Um, okay, so filmmaking, did that come around through university then, or studying, or how did, where did filmmaking come um, from? So filmmaking kind of uh, began for me with, um, in Shetland we had 
a, a youth filmmaking group called Madra Media, and that um, that was like really well supported uh, by the local arts. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name. <laughs> like not charity, local arts trust agency agency, agency yeah right. <laughs> yeah um so they had been wanting to develop youth filmmaking around the time that uh, me and my friends had decided that we wanted to start making films um and so like yeah that was around the time of like you know youtube was in its uh like what i consider its golden mm -hmm. era yeah. i don't think it's as good as it is anymore when it was like vloggers and like short filmmakers on it and uh, there was like loads of communities there's still communities but not the same like in the same sense of there being like a kind of like short film uh, mm. community in that i think that kind of shifted towards vimeo after a while um but we were um we were making short films, really bad short films, uh, like um, really weird, not bad, weird, weird short films. <laughs> um, and we were like, well, wouldn't it be good if we could, like, we had actual equipment to do this because we were just doing it on like camcorders. And um, the uh, the arts agency was just like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll buy you some equipment. And we're like, okay. <laughs> So like yeah, they just like allowed us. It's it's remarkable when I think about it that they just and like and kind of a testament to like um that, that kind of trust in uh its its youth that they would let us just go and take this quite expensive film equipment and like just go and make these weird short films. Um and then Around that time, there was a uh, the, the local film festival was taking off. So that's uh, the Screenplay Film Festival, which is um, curated by uh, Mark Camwood and uh, Linda Ruth Williams. So we were always making films with a view to like having them screened at the local filmmaking night on that. So yeah, after that, it was that was like when I was like fifteen. Mm -hmm. uh 15 16 age and yeah i remember just spending all of my summers like I, we didn't go on holiday um when that much when i was that age um so we would spend i would spend all my summers in chatless working in the local clothes shop and uh then going and making films with my friends on my days off and it was it was really fun. I really yeah. enjoyed those days. Um, and one of the most exciting things that happened to us was we made this short film called Masks, which uh, I look back on now and I'm just like, oh God, <laughs> it's, it's so evil. <laughs> but it's like, about, uh, it's like, it's this weird film um, about uh, like, it's like got drugs in it and like kind of trippy and arty and we thought we were so- So like, skins deep and clever yeah well no it's not it's not skins it's no. like it's like a it's short it's like almost a music video it's oh yeah it's, it's like the um well i can't remember the name of the song but it's got um amanda palmer's band oh dresden dolls yes the dresden dolls oh, yeah. um and then yes so we like that got featured though on the front page of uh, UK YouTube and we're just like we're amazing. Oh, that's amazing! <laughs> we're just like uh, it was so yeah. It was one of the uh, like one of the fu funnest uh, summers ever. Though we just like making films endlessly. We got up really really early in the morning to make that one, um, and there uh, it was just really fun. Yeah. So that's a uh, that's a uh, how filmmaking happened was I like, uh, end up making really weird comedy kind of films and then i'm we made masks which was more of a serious one and then after that i was hooked i just really enjoyed it and uh Beautiful. wanted to go study it as at university so uh, yeah and um i mean it's interesting because you know thinking about somebody who's the only other well not the only other but the other prominent you know scottish poet filmmaker combo would be margaret tate is the one that comes to mind who was uh, she was, was she Orcadian, Orkney? 
she was Orcadian. She was Orcadian, yeah. 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 So another island. Um, obviously not to compare or smash them together, but you know. Um... <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I quite like Orkney. I don't mind being conflated. <laughs> they're, they're cooler than us, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, not conflate, but um... so I mean, yeah. I was wondering, is there um, has there ever been a connection or affinity, you know, with her? Oh, or is absolutely. That... Yeah. yeah, I feel like when as soon as I saw her, her film poems, um, especially Landmaker, which is this, um, it's more like a film portrait, but the, it, it's all it's all poetry, for her really, and the way she um, she creates like uh, senses of rhyme and meter um, through uh, the length of cuts mm. and color cues that like that those things kind of function as like literary devices in her film films and i just oh i loved that and uh there's also her um her she made film portraits as well and they were they're so tender and and beautifully uh realized um and I yeah I definitely was inspired by like a portrait of Ga when I was doing my PhD project which was uh, making film poetry and film portraits um yeah she's she has a, just yeah I loved her way her way of noticing the world as well I mm. think that's um the there's a film poem called Art Will Burn where she follows a burn back to its source and that's just like these beautiful uh things that I had seen in the landscape myself that I had always thought worthy of of noticing being noticed and being um celebrated in mm. film is a really yeah there's definitely definitely uh feel a huge affinity with Margaret Tate yeah well that's always the power of those kind of artists I feel is that they kind of almost give you permission to do what you thought yeah. might have been risky and then you kind of see it. it's like oh no wait no they it, it's possible to make this to make this work yeah yeah. yeah, I agree. I think it's like, it's not even permission so much as just like a blueprint sometimes. Mm, it's mm. like you didn't, like, I don't think anybody needs like permission or validation in through through that, sure. that these means. But like, I think that it is inspiring to see it done and to feel feel a sense of uh, um, affinity and connection is really yeah it's just yeah. uh, it's just great <laughs> <laughs> i love it so much um so another aspect of your work that i found interesting is you know roland robertson has this term of the glocal you know which is this portmanteau of you know global and local um, i've never heard that before i love that <laughs> yeah i'm trying to remember where it came across i mean it must have been some niche academic essay on something <laughs> back and, but you know i think it's uh, you know, it's basically the idea of, you know, um, oh, you know what it was, actually? It's the editor of our local community magazine years ago. He oh. he was talking to me about it because he was talking about, you know, it was the idea of um, the, because obviously local, it's the idea of you, by focusing on your surroundings and your local areas with this kind of also this backdrop of a global understanding uh, as as kind mm -hmm. of a way to maybe combat some of the more sinister aspects of globalization for example yeah. you know um yeah. but i think it's really interesting because you know you're i, I don't know if I, I might not say this at the start but you know you were you know born and raised in shetland um and now based in edinburgh well at the moment you're in shetland but um yeah at the moment in Unts, but yeah Unts, sorry um <laughs> and then yeah but then based in edinburgh it's so um i suppose what i'm asking is like do you feel um uh what am i asking like the 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 <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that there's a it's a false binary between this cosmopolitanism and the rural do you think that actually that distinction isn't quite there or oh it's a very good question um i think uh i can i just write mainly from an island perspective and this islandness perspective i think is important for me to uh like put forward i guess because mm. it's like the, there's an idea of islands as um 
remote um and it's like when it, they've put as remote in in certain contexts it's like und not understanding that remote is it, a relative concept um Malachi Talik is a Shetland writer a novelist who uh, writes really well about this kind of concept of when you when you start thinking of islands as isolated and remote then um you you start to deny them their own centers mm. um and it's a position which island writers never never like uh occupy themselves it's always like this the island is the center to them um i think rob allen jim another shetland writer poet um he put it best in a poem which i i have an epigraph a little epigraph of he writes um a line that says the sea is the why the world comes to us and i like i love that idea that's like it's a central islandness idea to me is that it's not like inwardness there's like no like isolation and inwardness have nothing to do with this worldview it's mm. um it's about understanding connection like the sea does not not trap us off from the west the rest of the world it brings the rest of the mm. world to mm. us um and that's that's i guess that's the position that i feel ties in with that idea of, of the global yeah. which is such a good portmanteau I love yeah. it. <laughs> well because the i, I remember the, the kind of point is that like in terms of ecological awareness i think the global is very important because it's oh, this, yeah. the needing to know your own place in relation to or your own self in relation to the landscape while also being aware of a huge system that you know and for another spicy word from the academy hyper object <laughs> right which is the idea mm -hmm. that you know uh climate change is something that directly affects you but you can't see the entirety of it as an individual because it's just that too big um mm -hmm. so you know the local could be also interesting in that and i think what i wanted to go from there is kind of so in your film poems again or some of your most recent ones you kind of almost you conjure up these um these uh sort of new deities as it were or for example like gods of oil rigs and gods of driftwood mm -hmm. which kind of derive from shetlandic folklore um and i was wondering so a bit from that i was wondering is that kind of storytelling, is that kind of contemporary mythology something we need to actually be able to understand this climate crisis that is just too big to understand oh, on an individual level? I think so, yes. I think that's a really good question, but I have been like, strong, I'm strongly on the position that storytelling is so important to um, just connections with the landscape mm. in general. Um, I think uh, I've I've been reading a book recently called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, and there were so many ideas in that that just resonated with this idea of when you give um, when you give the land stories and they allow the land to have have a story attached to it, it makes it something worth like something. Um, beyond like the physicalness of it mm -hmm. um something that deserves protection uh because when the, it's lost then it's the story is lost as well um and i do i do think that the uh that's what a lot of my work tries to get back to is a sense of um not just connection with the land but connection through stories because a lot of um in in the local context that i'm working from um a lot of the oral tradition was lost because the first language was lost which was mm. uh, old norn which was a norse language um and it was lost only like 200 odd years ago um but like i mean it was in decline from a much further back than that but um the last speaker of it died only about 200 years ago but still it wasn't seen as worth preserving it wasn't seen as worth like writing down um in any any way that would make it the words that survive now more than a lexicon so 
that meant that everything in the oral history just disappeared. And this is the case for Orkney as well. Um, Orkney um, and Caithness, I think, have the same kind of uh, uh, norm context. Um, and there's a tendency to kind of romanticize Norn as this like the original lost language. Mm. And I, I'm less interested in what Norn was um, than the absence that it left yes. behind and having to deal with the, the absence that as a creative space in and of itself, um, because it's really all you've got to work with when you're looking back over the literary tradition in Shetland is like it, it, start, it starts in Victorian times and that's that's right. it really. Um, and the fragments of Dorn that have survived are very beautiful and they're weird and um, the kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a musicality uh, to that language that um, is just... Like it, I just feel sad that it's not there anymore, but that doesn't mean um but that like it, it, it exists within the uh as like a substratum in the current dialect that we have Shetland. Um so it's kind of yeah, a lot of my work is kind of like examining that space mm. and trying to bring stories out of that space um that can occupy the tensions in there as well um and i think that's a, where a lot of those uh those kind of deities came from mm. is this idea of the sacred and making something sacred is um is very interesting to me in terms of um a relationship with the land and like that on a psychological level i think that mm -hmm. uh it's I'm, I'm trying to appreciate ways of knowing the world which are not um that are not like I, that i feel that maybe in my experience of education have been undervalued in some way um so i'm trying to lean more into uh like not like not having like if um like having those kind of resonances mm -hmm. with folklore i i like i like the kind of uh um I like I like the stories that are attached to folklore. I love the uh, I love the way it makes me feel, and I think that's something important. Is like I always um, would think like um, I loved hearing ghost stories when I was young, um, but I was always like mindful of like they're not real they mm -hmm. can't be real um logically it's just impossible yeah and now i'm enjoying more the idea of like just like letting myself enjoy them and feel them and like maybe they are real i don't know <laughs> like i'm not going to um i'm, I'm not saying i believe them mm. but like enjoying the idea of believing them yes. more that makes any sense no, at all no, totally. i don't that's... really have a language for that <laughs> yeah well that's that's really interesting because um i don't know i keep seeing what i would call an apophatic or an apoph is that how you pronounce it apophat sort of an apophatic turn in a lot of writing at the moment especially in there was a really great anthology of four like young poets like under 20 by oh what was it called oh, i can't remember the press but it's called nascent and it was sort of young BAME voices. And it was what really struck me was that a lot of them, there was very much a kind of, like you were saying, there was like, there was a lot of days of absence, a lot of invocations of not X, you know, not something, you know, sonnets to, you know, the absence of blah, 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 or whatever. Um, uh, but also then notions of the sacred as well, because apophatic kind of comes from that, you know, the idea of... Mm absent presence something and nothing yeah yeah and then also that ambivalence as well is really interesting um because like, like you it's almost negative capability right which i suppose is the great poetic ambivalence you know the idea of like you know you even you deny even the conversation of it you're just like you let it happen and it's a doing uh -huh. of it <laughs> oh, you know yes. so um I don't know, yeah that's just interesting i don't know well i suppose also um we've kind of talked before about you know the idea of white space on the page um oh, yeah. and you know i remember you saying um your sort of poems are almost trying to destroy themselves sometimes yes, with the I idea like of the white like space slip into them yeah, yeah um, um so i wonder if you know the idea of absence kind of crosses over into that 
rating oh, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The white space, um, I find, is one of the most exciting ways of examining that absence, mm. presence thing. Um, yeah, like, and it's funny because recently I've been writing really big, chunky poems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not like, I'm not sure where that's coming from. It's just like in um, one of the last poems I wrote for Mother Die was Ophelia, which is is a bigger poem it's like it's much more blocky on the page i'm not sure if you can see i can see yeah that. a chungus yeah. yeah and so it's it's um and that's i've continued in that vein but like before it was very spindly mm. poems that are like 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 you said that like they are um they're like almost dis like disappearing into the white white space sometimes and i do love that i love i love the way um words look on the page and that's a very important aspect of writing poetry and the way that lines break as well um i mean obviously that's just like all poets care about <laughs> about line breaks but like um i like uh the way ways they break and like the relation of the break to the, the next line mm. um i obsess over that sometimes and get upset when it's not formatted right <laughs> oh man. well i think that's another universal struggle isn't it like you know the, yeah. the unformatting you know the, no yeah. yeah oh man but um i don't have much i don't know if i said anything no of course no but i mean <laughs> just you know, like yeah white states it's good <laughs> Um, I mean, that's honestly, that's a meaningful enough answer, you know, let's not, <laughs> let's not constrain this with questions and answers, you know, that's, it's ambivalent, that's what it is, it's ambivalent, it's just, it's there, oh. it's happened. Um, yeah, ambivalent, yeah. Ambivalent. Um, another sort of, you know, absent present, this is kind of maybe a bit of a, a left turn in some ways, but um, the, I want to kind of talk to you about the digital in some ways, um, mm. because... I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily explicit in, you know, Motor Die, your debut collection from Polygon, I should mention. Um, but I was wondering if, because again, you know, talking about, I mean, if we're talking about absent presence, I think, I mean, I don't know, in some ways I feel like people haven't quite grasped what the internet actually did, which is kind of just make an absolute break of reality and something, or just completely oh, yeah. threw all those questions up in the air because now suddenly you're on you're not anywhere, but then you've also got t six tabs open, so you're kind of weird, half present on all of those things, you know, like completely up the, completely. Uh, that's fascinating. I didn't even think about like tabs being like the past and the present. That's, oh, wow. No, that's blown my mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I mean, this is just, I'm just, I'm just swinging here. Um, but, you know. I love that. <laughs> or, or, I mean, like, you know, that even, you know, what we're doing right now is this kind of a weird absent present. So I was just wondering it if, is, yeah. um, and I'm being also, we're both writers who are kind of coming, well, not coming of age, but well, we have come of age during all of this, but also, um, writing within that time, I think is very exciting. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that or if there was any ways your work, you're either working on now or other stuff. I mean, obviously your filmmaking is digital of a sort as well. Yes. Oh, um, I've been thinking, yeah, I think about it quite a lot, um, because the way that, uh, poetry works on the page is so different to how it works on the screen. Mm. Um, and I, I come at this mainly from the screen and like the digital filmmaking side of things more than, um, any like internet poetry, yeah. uh, tradition if you can call it that at the moment <laughs> well yeah I mean, yeah that's the point. <laughs> um uh but the um like there are um like the way that it i felt that uh when i first started making film poetry i was like i'm not going to write any poetry before i go and film i wanted the film oh. to come first and the poem to come after okay um in in the editing process because i wanted to kind of mimic the way poetry um appears in in like for me it, um i i don't even really write in notebooks anymore um i i don't never write my poems down in notebooks anymore i always do it on a screen mm. 
um, because I feel like that's how my thoughts are able to keep up with with what's going on between like the page, like the screen does it much better for me than the page. Yeah. Um, but it also feels a bit like a bit strong. It's still like I feel like I should be writing and not like preserving the physicality of it or something. But um, I think that's just, I'm just still, I'm still learning my process. Um, and mm. it's, it's still, I'm, I'm still happy to be learning my process. I think that's a very nice thing to be doing. Um, because when you have moments like this happen where the entire world goes to hell, <laughs> then I can you kind know, of like I can be in a flux with that as, as yes, well. Yeah. Um so yeah, I've been finding um but get sorry, I've gone on a big tangent no, there. Um, no, yes. but getting back to the filming side of things, um, I was very determined not to um have a poem because I didn't want the poem to be like a script for the the film I wanted it to be going out into the landscape and noticing a poem in the mm. landscape and filming the poem in the landscape and then finding the words for it after because I feel like that is how my mind works as well is um very much visual first words after and I think that's maybe why I write poetry in some senses because I'm trying to translate the the way those images work in my mind um the kind of abstract way of thought into something that is on the on the page and contained by words put it into words into language um but then recently i've changed again and those films that i made for which had the deities in it did have poems beforehand mm -hmm. and i think partly that was because those were characters that were speaking um and they needed to be embodied in film. So it was like slightly different approach. But I think my, um, yeah, I haven't made a film poem since since those uh, those films. So I, I'm i feeling more inclined towards the, the way I did it first, which is a kind of more organic process. Yeah. But I also have a film crew now who I work with called the Kashyyyk Wife Collective and I think I don't know if I could put them through that <laughs> it's, such, it's a nightmare <laughs> for filming oh uh, so yeah yeah I don't know <laughs> I don't know how it's going to to work out but one of the things I'm quite I was quite excited about um being in the digital age uh, on, in terms of a linguistic context mm. is um, I became very excited by the idea of 3D images um, but not like I don't like 3D cinema I actually can't see 3D cinema um, I remember going to see The Hobbit um, in 3D and there's a bit where like a butterfly is supposed to come out of the screen and everybody was in the audience were like wow like a gasp it was so beautiful I was like what is it it's so bloody I can't see it <laughs> so um so what I'm, I like is that um I've discovered that apparently it's like now this is where the physicists are gonna like absolutely like tear me apart here Canceled like apparently physicists. it's like there's two there's two colors involved in it and like Im images on two different fields and like so if you take the lenses out of the glasses um 3d glasses and like replace them or swap them around then it converts it back into a 2d image so i like the idea of like having different glasses and you could see um, text on the screen in two different languages, but they exist at the same time. Oh, wow. Um, so that's something I would like to explore. Is, that sounds uh, amazing, yeah. Is that, but I don't know if it's possible. I don't know the physics of it. So maybe somebody with better skills will be able to tell me if that's actually possible or not. <laughs> well, I mean, like, yeah, amazing speculative, uh, speculative idea, regardless, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know? <laughs> like, if, if, if nothing else. Um, yeah, well, no, I like yeah, I like that that way. It, um, in in my mind, Shetland um, and English are very uh, like they're always in flux between like one's like ebbing, one's flowing, um, and but they both exist in my mind simultaneously, and like once did simultaneously exist mm. in in equal 
uh, in a balance. And I like the idea of that being like, that's like the holy grail for me. It's like, oh, it exists both at the same time. Yeah, and synthesis. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe one day. <laughs> well, no, for sure. No, that's weird. I mean, well, it's, um, you know, I also write nominally on digital surfaces as it were screens as well now mm -hmm. as well and there's it's funny i have i have a friend who is really into typewriters <laughs> and she gives oh. and she gave me one and she's always like write on it write on it and it's like i don't know it's always it is that weird sense of almost there's a weird guilt to it it's like oh it's not real but at the same time i don't know when i mean nicola barker says the novel is a digital beast for her she always oh, yeah. sees and experiences it as a digital thing and that's why her latest one i am sovereign um is very much about like there's emojis in there as well it's wild um and oh, stuff cool. it is yeah it's oh i mean i wrote my dissertation on it i was like you know that's so she's the one that wrote happy with the, yes with the bracket yeah i haven't read that yet but i have it oh so, my word yeah it's I'm oh excited to read it. it's it's a <laughs> it's so good it's a and that's also <laughs> talking about something digital like that is like that to a, a t um oh. But where was I going with that? But but like um, yeah, but it's interesting because it's almost like with digital books have become even more material and self consciously material, you know. In in yeah. um, it's like uh, for example, the books we just listed are very typographical and they're like really talking about the page and considering. Mm -hmm. And I mean, House of Leaves would be the earlier example of those two, you know um yes. which just goes crazy as well um it does oh my <laughs> goodness <laughs> um I, that's the book i read during lockdown that got me out of my reading funk oh um, amazing because I, I don't know about you but in the early days of lockdown i could not read i could not write i was just uh, everything was overwhelming yeah and for some reason house of leaves was the one that, i was just like this is absolutely <laughs> mental book that is like <laughs> disintegrates the text and is like an a labyrinth of a Absolutely. book and i was just like yes this is the book that will get me back into reading well it's like it's an even <laughs> more confined space maybe than your edinburgh yeah. flat <laughs> oh and it was it was it was like like talking about houses that like so like for anyone who doesn't know house of leaves is a um about a house that keeps growing infinitely um and uh it's I've got about a filmmaker as well and I'm just like I'm reading this in this tiny flat wishing that I had like a bit more space I was like do I really want space like, do I it seems scary now <laughs> yeah that is the scariest book I've ever read I've got to say it's terrifying yeah. oh my goodness the existential um, dread yeah. of that book is something else it's, but I loved it oh yeah no it's, it's very good book. Uh, absolutely that's worth it yeah yeah um what now <laughs> sorry i'm just looking to my notebook let me see oh don't worry um uh... i think you were saying something about uh writing on digital yeah well digital... it's just yeah well it's just you know it's that there is that weird self-consciousness i suppose the positive i find in writing digitally is that it's you know like i'm working on a novel at the moment and like to be able to go like that to search up something that is important. Yes. Or or if I mid sentence I think of what will come in a few sentences this time, I can start writing the notes for that down there. And like mm -hmm. I mean like this is kind of maybe a scatterbrained personality just like manifesting. <laughs> that's just how I work. And I find I suppose uh, I suppose it's not that it's a worse way or a better way, it's just different. Because with the typewriter, yeah. the, the I suppose with the typewriter it is deliberation. And that deliberation also leads to some other result, but um being erratic also leads to a kind of result which I feel is more me-ish. But then at the same time, I know when it comes to digital stuff, I mean, like, I do... I am very ambivalent about a lot of it. I feel like I've become very close to, like, deleting social media accounts through lockdown. Just, like, oh, yeah? just saying, yeah, just, like, being, like... It's not because social media, in some ways, is a tragedy of what it's done to... Digi like, talking about early YouTube being better, I mean, like, there's a truth to that. You know, like, and in, in, in some ways, social media is almost the, uh, I don't know what, it, it, it kind of, it, it blocks those kind of what I liked about digital, doing stuff yeah. digitally. So, like, in some ways, maybe trying to get rid of, and like, I don't know, the tyranny of numerics, you know, like, 
this, <laughs> yeah you know um so like it's even though i'm very invested in digital i think there's also a lot about it it's like i want con well not control it controls naive but you know i want to be able to have a a difference of it i don't know yeah i know what you mean i just i i felt got like such a waxing and waning relationship with social media i don't know i i i never had this before this is a very recent phenomenon for me but i i go through periods of being almost shy of like like posting on social media i don't ever want to like engage with it and like before i was posting things like having a cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> things like just really inane stuff that was innocent i wouldn't even think of like um i wouldn't think of thinking twice about putting out mm. online and now i'm like i feel like my relationship with social media is one of almost standing on a stage shouting out to everybody in mm. the world but like you still think that you're only talking to your friends and it's uh, interesting and it's strange it's a strange feeling i don't know i don't i don't know how to uh handle it handle the anxiety that gives me because uh i get very anxious sometimes just even just posting a, a very inane tweet there are times when i like get stuart my partner to o look over a tweet that i'm about to do and, like this, that's not gonna offend anyone right <laughs> like, it's, it's okay isn't it i've not done anything wrong <laughs> well, like yes what are you talking about it's fine <laughs> well i mean um you know i mean, i think you know bull burnham hero of both of ours you know he talked about yeah. what social media did or what twitter did specifically is that it democratized the anxieties of like a d-list celebrity to everyone yes which is oh, yeah you know um i mean and maybe yeah oh gosh i'm sound i don't want to sound like a therapist but i don't know maybe is it because you're you know um now that you're a a, a published author is there maybe that kind of shift to things and you know more follows and obviously maybe. you've been active with um sort of local activism in regards to uh the uh, the yes. festivals the, the yeah the black lives matter um and the uphill yeah yeah campaign but on social media that was that was very frightening actually <laughs> in terms of, like uh it, like that like not not for like um any particular reason other than my own thoughts like i i was very very scared to to make those posts but it seems like very very important and mm. something had to be said and i I don't have a huge platform at all. I, I think I don't take myself very seriously as anybody of any importance. Um, but uh, I did have enough of a following at that point to feel like I could make something. I had, uh, I had enough graphic design skills to make it shareable and it, that's, that's, yeah, that's, um, but that, that, that put me into such a anxious frame of mind mm. when I first started doing it. And it was just the first post that was very frightening. It was get the response was very positive. It was clearly something everybody had been thinking and wanted to address, but felt like they couldn't. And I think in an island context, it's very difficult to speak about those kind of things um, without feeling um, I mean, it's like very difficult to um, criticize in terms of like, uh, to speak up in terms of that because it's like your friends and it's the exact same situation across the board. Mm. Um, but it, in an island context, you, you feel like there's a community aspect, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's like very silencing. I don't know. I'm just talking rubbish now. No, no, not at all. No, I mean, I think it's, I think, yeah, well, I think in that sense, that's, um, also, I mean, first of all, you know, talking about ambivalence towards social media, I mean, the thing with social media is that there's a lot of good things and they can do good things. So it's not as easy yeah. as calling it out. And that's kind of where the, the problem almost lies is that it's not totally either or. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose the second thing as well, I mean, talk about, apathetic i mean like people were you know with um this summer and with you know the protests 
the BLM protest. I mean, like, it was very much a sense of, you know, again, that Alma's absent presence weirdness of, like, I want to help. This is such a visceral yeah. reality, but I am also yeah, so yeah. far and helpless. So, I mean, in that sense, I mean, it, you know, I think that's a, a good use of... Um, uh, you could say it's glocal. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it is. De- this is all planned and deliberate. Um, no, but it's, it's um, you know, it is, but it's, it's actually thinking about what can I do in this context. And I mean, like, you know, um, I think perhaps the most, you know, apophatic thing I saw that summer was, you know, when, I mean, whatever CIA operative came up with the idea of Blackout Tuesday is a dark, dark genius. Oh, God, I know. Um, you, know the, so, you know, the idea of posting a black square, literally creating a negation that would then yeah. black out a, a feed, a, a hashtag, hashtag feed feed that would be and full I of pa- information. I participated Me too, in me that. too. I, I was just yeah. like, I did, I, uh, to be fair, I didn't use the hashtag, but yeah. I posted a black square and I was like, what am I doing? Like, this is just meaningless and like but then that was like an interesting reckoning to have as well Mm. for like um like because it did create a discussion around like an an awareness around the importance of the digital hashtag which i hadn't really thought about properly before and like so i mean no it was a terrible thing to to get rid of so much vital information with the black lives matter hashtag but um on the other hand we are we hopefully now know not to be that stupid <laughs> yeah well but i mean it was like a two-hour turnaround you know and to be fair i think yeah. it, it was the aesthetics i mean this is uh, this is what they say about uh, you know it's like the aesthetics of protest protest rather than protest itself but i mean like the it was very striking to go through an instagram feed and seeing nothing but black squares it was. but it was, it's just yeah. you know then you know the road to hell is paved with good intentions, as Simone, <laughs> Simone like Weil squares. said. As, as, <laughs> you know, um, so yeah. So I mean, yeah. basically, my point is, in contrast to that, I think you know, actually thinking locally and being like, what is well, this that's, thing? That's know? what I wanted to. Um, how I wanted to act was like, and it was kind of the strange um, moment for Shetland because there was. Uh, um, a, a group called Shetland Stands for Black Lives Ma- We Black Lives Matter, and they um, organised an amazing socially distanced protest throughout all of Shetland. Mm. So the way that it worked was they had like, um, what was it? Uh, like uh, posters. They made posters, and then people could go and pick up posters from like allotted places all across Shetland. Go on a socially distant walk, and um, just like yeah it was just it was amazing Mm. hundreds and hundreds of people turned out for it um and usually protests happen it's like oh we're gonna meet at the town square in Ladwick and it's like well nobody from Unst can come nobody from Liel all the different islands people who are too far away will not come um but that meant that everyone could participate and add their voice um and it was very like tied in with the um like it was, it was to show support for Black Lives Matter, but it was also very much tied in with, with the issue of blackface being used in Upheli mm-hmm. Um and so that was, a kind of like it was. It seemed to be like that the time had like really, um, like the timing of it all was was interesting because as soon as I posted my um, my infographics about why blackface is we really shouldn't be doing like my, my word no like, radical proposition yes <laughs> god it's just like dear lord i can't believe it's 2020 yeah. and i was making posts yeah. like that that was part of it as well it was like the shame i felt having to like like listen guys this <laughs> is this is not okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> like um the yeah the um then there was a lass called Ellie Ratter who um, who had written to all of the um, the Uphelia committees, asking them to not like explaining the the context and like why it's not okay. Um, and then the Shetland Stands group had launched their um, had launched their 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 organizing for the protest and. Um, 
and uh, a last called Chloe Miller had spoken on the radio about how um, like blackface affected her when she was going to a Pelia squads. Um, and it was just like, it was just like this, this, like there was so much discussion around it. Um, and I hadn't, I, I had thought that I was just going to be sending this out into the, into the, uh, into the dark essentially. And, oh, it wouldn't wouldn't resonate or something like mm. I had little faith in it in like anything I said actually helping in any way but it felt like I couldn't just I just couldn't not say yeah, anything yeah. um and it it's it's been really good though it, it's like the like Ellie Ratter's letter in particular um a lot of the Uphelia squads, uh, Uphelia committees have now committed to like just outrightly mm. banning it, um, which is, I mean, <laughs> it should have been banned back like 30 years ago or whatever. Mm. Like it should have, it should never have happened in the first place, but um, it's, it's better late than never, I guess. Yeah, um, 100%. So we'll see. We'll yeah. see how, how it pans out at the next Apelia. There's no Apelia this year. This year and I course. don't think I don't think there's gonna be one next year. Um so uh, well maybe they'll forgotten and then they'll <laughs> just be like back to normal. Everything this whole year was a dream. <laughs> <laughs> um Okay, yeah, I think one more question. Kind of on digital, but maybe um maybe on a light note. Um you got any good re- YouTube recommendations? YouTube recommendations. Yeah, anything good. Uh, so, like, um, do you mean like uh, what I watch currently on YouTube or from back in the day? <laughs> uh, like currently, currently, yeah. Currently, because I was like, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> where to find any of those old films. <laughs> um, the uh, the YouTuber I watched this morning um, is a guy called Big Joel. Is yeah, he, Big Joel's good. Yeah. I love, uh-huh. love Big Joel. Um, yeah, Big Joel is my shout out today. He uh, he did a video essay about um, the, uh, the Studio Ghibli film, My Neighbor Totoro. And I think it just is such a beautiful reading of one scene. And I love the way he just like hones in on the editing and the, like the way... Um, the way meaning is created throughout that um, that one small scene. It's such a perfect way of looking a close attention, um, a kind of yeah, a close attention to the world and and to art that I really appreciate and love to hear. So Amazing. yeah, I recommend Big Joel. <laughs> perfect. I'll have to catch that. Um, Roseanne, thank you so much for joining me for the conversation. And lovely to speak to you too. Yeah, lovely to speak to glad you. Glad that. All the way from once to, to <laughs> <Lynn Lithgow. laughs>